Um, so welcome to the Jenkins Users Conference, uh, or user, singular. Uh, my name is Andrew Baer, uh, and this is Seven Habits of Highly Effective Jenkins Users. Uh, I'm the build and tools architect at Cloudera. Uh, I'm a contributor to Jenkins Core and author and contributor to a number of plugins since, actually, I think that's off by a year. I think it was spring of 2008. Um, we actually uh, figured out when a bunch of us showed up for the first time in Jenkins uh, earlier this year for the 10th anniversary. And I'm a member of the Apache Software Foundation, and I volunteer maintaining uh, Apache's uh, Jenkins instance, uh, builds.apache.org, and various other things. Uh, so what's this talk about? These are lessons that I've learned and that other people I know have learned over the last five to 10 years from maintaining large Jenkins instances, often more than one of them, uh, in terms of what your best practices and bad ideas are. Uh, at Cloudera, for example, we've got five Jenkins masters, each of which have over 1,000 jobs, uh, with dozens running all the time. We run, <laughs> it's actually a fairly ridiculous number of jobs at this point. And at builds.apache.org, we've got a different kind of problem where we've got a lot of jobs, but more importantly, we have a lot of different project teams doing things in very different ways, but all on the same master. Uh, so before I start, I should always give my caveats, always give my, my warning. Your mileage may vary. These, I, I believe that these habits I'm going to talk about are going to be valuable on every Jenkins instance, but some of them are more relevant at a large scale uh, for more complex jobs, more production-critical workflows. And, but at the core, these are my recommendations. They're based on my experiences and what I know of. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. There is no one answer. So do what's best for your situation uh, and use these just as a, a starting point. So the first habit is, I think, the most critical one. It's to make your master stable and restorable. Uh, or actually, if your master is not stable, if your master is not restorable, then when it goes down, your users can't build anything. You can't ship, you can't test, and that's obviously not good. And restorable because machines die. And with Jenkins storing everything on disk, that means if you have a disk failure, you can end up losing a lot of history. Or you can also inadvertently rm-rf slash var lib Jenkins. I've done it. Um, and you need to be able to recover from those emergencies. Anything that's production quality or your production level of importance needs to be production quality and its re uh, restorability. So the first uh, part of that is to always use LTS releases. Uh, the long-term support releases for Jenkins, uh, the trains are created about every 12 weeks, um, roughly every three months, and the active train gets updated three times before the next one starts. If you're familiar with Ubuntu's LTSs, like 12.04 and 14.04, it's a similar kind of model, where those, uh, the LTS releases get fixes backported to them from the master branch, from what's going on elsewhere, but not features. It's, it's a more stable, more reliable uh, version that doesn't going to have the same kind of compatibility breaking or functionality breaking changes. And more importantly, the LTS releases go through a lot of testing before they go out. Uh, this started with uh, a really big uh, testing matrix that was run through at Red Hat, and it's grown since then. So we validate that accepted be expected behavior continues to behave the way we expected on the LTS releases before they go out the door. Uh, I think that's really important. The normal Jenkins releases, it's great that we release weekly. I mean, continuous delivery, huh? But they're bleeding edge. It's the only reason you should ever run a Jenkins release that's new is if there's something in that you specifically need for that use case. And even there, you're probably going to get bit by bugs that you did not expect and that are in different areas. Uh, 
Again, be conservative about upgrading plugins. Plugins can change a lot without you actually being able to tell they change a lot. Part of that is that we're not great about updating uh, the release notes. There's actually some work going on there to try to automate that and base it on Git history more. Uh, but on the wiki, you can see, oh, there's a new release. What changed? Eh? Um, and even when those changes are fairly well explained, what they mean is not necessarily explained well. Backwards compatibility can break, and it can break bad. Uh, the example I always cite is the extended email plugin, which I'm willing to bet most of you uh, who have Jenkins instances have the extended email plugin. It's about as core uh, as a plugin can get that isn't actually part of the core. But they drastically changed uh, how their recipient and trigger settings worked uh, in early 2014 so that all of a sudden, our emails started going to way more people than they were supposed to, including a lot of people who didn't work at Cloudera. Um, it's a fun advantage of open source there. Uh, so you need to be careful about your plugin updates because you may pull in things you didn't expect. You may break your existing workflows and existing tools. And new features in plugins can be very unstable and problematic in the wild. Again. Just because somebody wrote a new feature and it works great in their use case and their environment doesn't mean it will keep working in yours. Always be conservative. Uh, only upgrade a plugin if you need to. That's my basic opinion. I'll upgrade it if there's something very specific I need in there, and even then I will test it a lot myself before I'll upgrade it. <laughs> and speaking of that, you should have an upgrade test bed. I'm not as good about this as I should be. Uh, because it can be hard to build a good test upgrade, uh, upgrade test pad. Because what you want is to have an environment where you can replicate some set of your job's behavior, some set of the coverage of your plugin usage, so that you can verify that your critical workflows will keep working with your upgraded plugins, with your upgraded core. Uh, if at all possible, you really want to do this at scale with a decent amount of jobs and with a decent amount of builds and slaves, et cetera. You also need to make sure that these changes get a chance to bake in, that you give them a few days to run before you assume everything's working. Just because a build ran once successfully doesn't mean it's going to run successfully under every condition that it's going to hit on a regular basis. I mean, if your build is successful nine times out of 10 normally, it could turn out that the only way things go horribly wrong is if the build's failed. So you kind of need to make sure the build will fail at some point to see what it'll do. <laughs> and you should back up. Uh, for me, this one was not very uh, intuitive. I just didn't actually think about it very much. But there are a lot of different options and ways that you can back up Jenkins. Since Jenkins is serializing straight to disk, it's both simpler and harder in that there's no one right answer for how you should back up. Uh, I've looked at a number of backup plugins for Jenkins. I don't love any of them. The thin backup plugin is the best I've seen. Some of the backup plugins can be a little intrusive and cause some stability problems. Thin backup seems to be the best I've run into, but it's not my primary backup means. Uh, I use... Uh, the latter two examples that I've got here. We have an rsync backup of the full Jenkins tree that we run uh, every night. But that means that I need to have disks as big as my Jenkins master just to back that stuff up. And I don't care about the build artifacts or the build history. I care about the configuration. So the more important stuff is, uh, I think, backing up your configuration files. Uh, the slide deck, well, previous versions of the slide deck are already up on SlideShare. This will be up on SlideShare after the talk. And there's a link there to uh, a script that I wrote that I use to find the relevant config files and check them into Git just to use that as a source of backup. So, because that way I know I can recreate all of the jobs and the configuration just by checking that out and copying it somewhere. I don't keep the build history, but build history shouldn't be that important. Uh, don't use the Maven job type. Uh, I love Maven. I know that a lot of people hate it. They're wrong. 
Uh, but the Maven job type in Jenkins seems really elegant. I loved it at first. I spent a lot of time working on getting it to do better parallelism, getting it to do incremental builds, getting it to do all these nifty things. Then I realized it's a giant pain because there's a number of things that are different about the Maven job type than the freestyle or matrix job type that will result in some plugins not working right, that will make you vulnerable to issues with lazy loading. Uh, you end up loading a lot more builds because each individual module counts as a build. It just gets, it can go exponential really quickly and really hurt you if you're vulnerable to performance. And so, unless you have a really good reason why you have to use the Maven job type and not just Maven build steps in a freestyle project, don't use it. It seems niftier, it's not worth the cost. Uh, habit number two, break up the bloat. Uh, if you've got a lot of different teams and projects, you should have more than one master. Uh, there's a number of really good reasons for that, but the main ones are that if you've got multiple teams, they've got multiple needs. They're going to need different plugins. They're going to need different plugin upgrades. They're going to, uh, you'll eventually hit some performance problems, et cetera. So if you split it out, and there's, you can split that by team, by function, by control. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. You're going to get more stable Jenkins masters, and it's going to be a lot easier when you need to make changes to your Jenkins masters. There is a plugin, uh, the Parameterized Remote Trigger plugin, that theoretically can communicate between Jenkins masters. That's an area that I think really needs to improve so that you can really do orchestration across multiple masters. Uh, I think Cloudbees has some stuff in the works in that direction, but uh, I'm mainly working in the, the, the free and open source area. <laughs> Break up your jobs, not just your masters. Uh, Obviously, modularization and reuse is good in programming, and it's just as good in Jenkins. Uh, Multi-job builds, you know, a workflow that's made out of a number of different jobs that run together, will allow you to reuse a generic job when you've got a particular chunk of behavior that's going to happen more or less the same from, say, 10 different projects. They're all going to need to build uh, RPM packages, and they're all going to have the same entry point for building that. They're just going to be building a, from a different source pa package. So have a generic job that they all can call that will do the same thing. Uh, but even if you can't go with the generic, just breaking things out into multiple jobs allows you to restart partway through so that you're not in that wonderful situation where a random uh, EC2 instance falls over nine and a half hours into a 10-hour build, and you can't restart it without going all the way through again. Uh, if you've got a multi-job build that you've set up correctly, that you've designed thinking about this use case, you can restart it partway through and continue. Uh, there are any number of tools for breaking up your jobs. I personally use the kind of Swiss Army knife of the parameterized trigger plugin and conditional build step a lot. It's lower level. It's not as easy to configure as something like the workflow plugin that all the Cloudbees people will always talk about. But it fits more smoothly into the Jenkins UI. It uh, easily works with all your other plugins, and it is ludicrously powerful. Uh, but I think the direction that we're going is more uh, the workflow plugin, the idea of a multi-job workflow, a multi-step workflow as something native to Jenkins that Jenkins actually understands and doesn't just uh, interoperate with. Um, but you do have to define your job with a DSL. Uh, it's a fairly simple DSL. It's not a problem. But it isn't quite as nice as just going through the UI. <laughs> uh, third habit, automate Jenkins tasks. Uh, I'm lazy. Uh, I think most of us should be lazy. If you're not lazy, get lazy. We all work in the computer industry. We don't do things by hand. So why should you be doing things by hand in Jenkins? You can get deep into Jenkins and its own controls uh, and the internals using uh, either the script console or the script load plugin, where you can use Groovy scripts to really get deep into Jenkins and its object model and make changes to your jobs. Uh, 
find bad patterns in job configuration. So I can find when people have misconfigured the email plugins. And you can use the Scripler plugin to store and share those Groovy scripts so that you can reuse them on that master, and you can reuse them on other masters, and you can use other people's plugins. It's very handy for sharing and reusing utility scripts that make you able to have a greater power over Jenkins. Some of the examples that I've used from the uh, Scripler catalogs, these are publicly available scripts that you can get through the Scripler plugin. Disable and enable jobs matching a pattern, so that when a release is done, I just disable all of the jobs for that release so they don't randomly start building again. <laughs> uh, you can clear the build queue when something goes insane and spawns 150 builds that are all waiting and you don't want to have to click through each of them by hand. Uh, you can tweak the log rotation or discard all builds configuration across all your jobs so that you can dictate a policy, say, yeah, you don't get to have more than 15 builds archived, and enforce that across all the jobs of all of your users. You can turn off SCM polling at night every night, so that, or off during the day or whatever permutation, so that you're polling when it's relevant and you're not running builds when no one really cares. And probably my favorite, you can actually run the log rotator and make it go discard old builds that, according to the rules, should be thrown away uh, without having to run a new build of each of those jobs, uh, which is great when you just need to purge stuff. Uh, related to this are system groovy build steps. Uh, with the system groovy plugin, you can run these kinds of scripts as part of your jobs. You can actually have your job talked and uh, control the Jenkins internals. Uh, this is not the most secure thing in the world, obviously, because you've got, you're giving your job full access to Jenkins. But it's a great way to pilot a concept for a plugin and see how it would work and uh, without actually having to go through all the process of writing a plugin and all the pain when you have to upgrade. Uh, or do things that build on to existing plugins or that don't quite get big enough to be worth their own plugin. We use these heavily for uh, tricking the uh, Jenkins Cloud Provisioner to provision things a little earlier when we know they're going to be needed or for checking our build history to see why the build failed and automatically retrying it on a, when we're talking about a large multi-node build that sprawls across a lot of things, looking for patterns in the history and auto retrying when appropriate. <laughs> you can also uh, run scriptler steps as build steps uh, so that you can do the same kind of thing there. Uh, and you can generate jobs from code. Now we've, I, uh, back when I was always using the REST API or the CLI to basically write the XML or pull down XML for an existing job, tweak it, post it. And that works. But you can also define your whole job or workflow of multiple jobs in a job DSL. Uh, two examples of that are my favorite, the job DSL plugin, um, which is a full Groovy DSL for defining a Jenkins job with the Groovy representing, the, the DSL represents the Jenkins object model. Um, so it does require you to actually know what the Jenkins job configuration is. So it is definitely a power tool, but you can use it to do things like, to, you can generate your jobs from a build step. So we have a fairly complicated script and whenever we branch for a new release, we have 30 different components that also need new builds when we do that. One script gets uh, run when we do that and it creates and updates all of the appropriate jobs without any direct intervention, so that we're able to propagate changes, change our version numbers and all that by just changing things in one place and having a job that pulls against that script and runs it when something's changed. <laughs> and there is a great talk by uh, Daniel Spilker, Letter Today, about this plugin, and you should go see it. And I'm not just saying that because I love the plugin. Mainly I'm saying that because I love the plugin. Uh, on the other side, there's the .ci plugin. If you're familiar with Travis, You've probably seen the, the .travis.yaml, where it's a kind of declarative, fairly simple jobs. You don't have a lot of power, but you just dis declare your job in the YAML, and Travis just does it. You don't actually have to go to the UI. You don't have to configure anything. It'll just happen. Uh, the .ci plugin came out of uh, Groupon, and it's very similar. 
There's a YAML file, you define your job in there, and it will automatically generate the Jenkins jobs for you. <coughs> Sorry, wrong hand. Uh, and then there's the workflow plugin. It's, as you may have seen, it's a uh, way to define multiple complex steps in just one relatively simple DSL. I have not really used it yet, I'll be honest. Uh, I was wary of it for a while. Uh, it didn't run on LTSs for a while. It's a new job type. You can't just use your existing jobs. You have to start over. And when you've got a big enough uh, technical debt or just inertia behind your built jobs, you can't really change everything over. So I'm not going to recommend you don't use it, but I'm not going to necessarily recommend you use it either. I think it's worth investigating, and I'd like to hear what people's experiences with it are, but I don't feel qualified to say anything on it yet. Uh, habit number four, tend your plug-in garden. So uh, this is a Simpsons reference. Uh, Dear Mr. Jenkins, there are too many plugins these days. Please eliminate 300. P.S. I am not a crackpot. There are over 1,000 plugins. That is too many plugins. I mean, plugin discovery is hard. Uh, it's not easy to figure out what the right plugin for your use case is or whether that plugin can cause problems how the plugins will interoperate. So you should be careful about your plugin usage. You should not install a plugin unless you know you're going to use it. Don't just install plugins on your production master because maybe you're going to use it or it looks interesting. Use a test bed for that. Figure out how it would work for you before you install it. There's a lot of duplication of functionality across plugins. Figure out which one does what you need uh, and install that one. Don't get like 80% of the functionality from one plugin, but then you get another plugin that has a slightly different subset of the 80%, and try to settle on maybe not getting everything you need, but with as few plugins as you can use. Uh, and plugins can cause real instability in areas you don't expect, and they can uh, add a lot of uh, time to load and runtime for jobs. So if you're not going to use a plugin, why take a hit from it? Why have risk from it if you're not going to use it? Uh, when you remove plugins, uh, well, it's easy to uninstall or disable them in the Jenkins UI. And then after you've restarted, uh, when you go to ma manage Jenkins, there may be a note there about old data. You can just clear that out that, with uh, the button there. That will remove references to the uninstalled plugin from your configuration, your build files, which will speed up your build loading, your build and config loading in the future. Uh, so these are some of my essential plugins, just, just a subset. Uh, job config history plugin, it's not source control for Jenkins, but it works a lot better than source control integration with Jenkins has. Uh, it can let you see what changed in jobs and who did it. Still XML diffs, so it can be a little weird sometimes, but it's a good way to see what happened when and by who. I always recommended the disk usage plugin until about a year and a half ago when it just went insane and completely lost the ability to scale across large numbers of uh, builds. So it's a good example of having, getting bit by a, uh, a plugin that's gone a little bit sour as it's gotten newer. Uh, the whole suite of static analysis plugins and the tooling around them are fantastic. If you're not generating JUnit formatted XML from your uh, tests right now, if you're using no, no, not using something like uh, JUnit or Surefire or Nose, uh, the XUnit plugin uh, has converters from a whole lot of fairly common uh, test output formats into the JUnit format that Jenkins speaks. So that way you can use, uh, you can really take advantage of Jenkins' built-in test reporting to, even if you're not using JUnit style tests. Like I mentioned, the parameterized trigger and conditional build step plugins are my Swiss Army knife. They're uh, th about as power tool as you can get in terms of constructing uh, chains of jobs. And the tool environment plugin is great when you've got, yeah, you've got your Maven and, J and Java and Ant and Groovy and all those tools configured in Jenkins. And if you're using you know, the Maven build step, great. It ends up in your environment automatically. But with the tools environment plugin, you can just check a box, and it will automatically install the tool for you. 
and then it'll be available in your uh, build steps environment so that you can use Java in a shell step and not worry about having to install Java. Uh, Nvinject is probably the best option these days for say, uh, exporting uh, environment variables and loading environment variables into your build. I'm wary on this because there are differing opinions out there. It's an area that, where there's been a lot of turnover over the years, and th the Nvinjec plugin has gotten a bit of feature bloat, and so I'm not 100% sure how well it interacts with other plugins. The Rebuild plugin is an incredibly simple plugin that I cannot live without. Uh, we have a ton of parameterized builds in our uh, setups, and so how do you rerun a build you have to go re-enter all of the parameters again with the rebuild plugin. You just click the rebuild button, gives you the form with uh, the fields already pre-populated with that build's uh, parameters. Click build, there you go. Just simple, wonderful. Uh, the build timeout plugin. Builds hang, or just don't finish, or take too long, and you need to shoot them sometimes. The build timeout plugin does that. It can do absolute time, elastic timeouts, uh, based on whether there's output. It's a really, really handy plugin. But like I mentioned at the beginning, don't take my word for it alone. Don't assume that, these are the o that you have to be using these plugins or that these are the only plugins you should use. These are what I consider my essential plugins uh, for, from my experience and for my use cases. You may not need any of these plugins. You may need completely different plugins. And I didn't even get into things like source control plugins, because those seem fairly self-explanatory. But these are plugins that I think have a lot of versatility and a lot of value, and with the possible exception of Nvinject, very little risk. They're stable, they're well-designed, they fit well into Jenkins, and they don't cause problems particularly. Uh, when you install a plugin, always remember to check the global Jenkins configuration afterwards. Uh, a decent number of plugins have global configuration that you should take a look at. You may not want the defaults. You may want to tweak uh, the default behavior of an otherwise great plugin, like the job config history treats uh, every individual Maven module as a separate job and saves each of the uh, change for each of those anytime you change the, jo the parent job itself, which is completely redundant, creates hundreds of tiny files for no good reason. It, but you can j change that just by going to the global configuration and changing the settings. <laughs> Fifth habit, integrate with other tools and services. <laughs> so. Like pretty much anything else anyone's actually using these days, Jenkins plays well with others. It integrates well with other tools and vice versa, uh, either via Jenkins plugins or the Jenkins REST API. It's really easy for other tools to talk to Jenkins, and it's obviously very easy for Jenkins to talk to those other tools. You can trigger builds based on GitHub pull requests. You can update Jira upon successful builds, and a lot more. I'm only going to touch on a couple of these uh, tools or services uh, because these happen to be ones I'm familiar with and use, but there are many, 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 many more on the Jenkins wiki. Uh, this is why we have over 1,000 plugins. So yeah, source control, duh. I mean, if you're not using source control, you should be using source control, and are you a time traveler from 1990? Uh, so moving on. Uh, the Garrett and GitHub pull requests. Uh, the Garrett trigger plugin uh, by Robert Sandell, now of uh, CloudBase. The GitHub pull request builder plugin. Uh, JKS Enterprises uh, version of the GitHub pull request bu builder plugin, which I prefer, it's simpler, are all really useful. Uh, again, like Travis, uh, we'll run builds for you whenever there's a pull request. Same model. When there's a change proposed in Garrett or a pull request open on GitHub, it'll run a build. It'll uh, report back to the review tool with the results of the build so that you can then make your decision about whether that change is actually good or not, not just based on a, a you know, manual code review, but based on whether or not it builds and passes tests. It 
felt revolutionary five years ago when I first worked on a workflow like this. Now it just kind of feels like the default. It's, of course you're doing that, right? Uh, and so with this, you can enable a lot more automation for promotion, for automatic merging, for uh, a more complicated workflow that doesn't require as much human intervention, but still gets you through multiple levels of testing, multiple levels of uh, validation of stability. <laughs> uh, Jira, or I assume there's other bug trackers, uh, but Jira is the best of the worst as far as I know. You can update Jira issues when uh, commits with messages containing those issues go into Jenkins. Now, there's, you can also integrate GitHub with Jira, but it's a little questionable in my mind. Uh, you can follow the build fingerprints that Koske has mentioned in the context of the Docker traceability plugin so that uh, a commit that went into a far upstream project with a Jira in it can be identified as being resulting in fixing a bug in a downstream project, because the downstream project is consuming the output of the upstream project. And one of my favorites, you can generate release notes, Jira release notes, as part of the build process. Uh, anything that makes our doc team not have to do uh, incredibly boring and automatable work, like generate release notes out of Jira, is an inherently good thing. <laughs> Artifactory. Uh, so the Jenkins Artifactory plugin uh, allows you to do things like define your credentials for deployment or your configuration for artifact resolution across all of your jobs without, in, in one place. So it's kind of like the Maven settings file, except it doesn't just work with Maven. It works with anything that's interacting with Artifactory. Uh, you can override Maven's uh, distribution management section on a per job basis. I'm not sure how often you want to do that, but if you're using a staging model, that might be handy. <laughs> you can restrict where the Maven jobs and build steps will look to resolve artifacts. So you can block them from looking outside when you're running your official build. So you can be sure that you actually have all of the things they care about mirrored onto your artifactory server. And you can capture build info and the relationships between artifacts and builds and each other in Artifactory uh, through the Jenkins plugin. <laughs> then, of course, there's Docker. Uh, everybody loves Docker these days. It's, it's, it's the new hotness. It's the cool thing. It's totally much cooler than OpenStack was. Uh, I haven't used any of CloudBee's Docker plugins yet, so I can't actually say whether they're any good, but I'm assuming they are. And it's definitely, there's a lot of really fascinating areas th there. If you're using Docker, you've got to build Docker images. Automation around that that integrates more smoothly with uh, Jenkins is going to be useful. Uh, running your jobs in Docker containers is an area I'm really interested in. If you have to support uh, building uh, your software on a whole lot of different platforms, uh, we have to build packages for eight different uh, Linux distributions, for example. That's a lot of different AMIs that I have to have for a lot of different EC2 instances so that I can build all of our stuff on all of those platforms. Being able to build in containers will make our lives a lot simpler. Uh, traceability is always a good thing. Knowing what you built where and how it's used is an inherently good thing. And if you're going to use workflow, integrating Docker and workflow seems like it's probably a good idea. Uh, the sixth habit, make your slaves fungible. So what does fungible mean? The dictionary definition is fungibility is the property of a good or commodity whose individual units are capable of mutual substitution. In other words, a fungible slave is a slave you can easily replace with another slave. You don't have to go manually configure it. You don't have to you know, uh, go to the effort of uh, getting IT to provision a new host for you or buying new hardware and then installing from scratch. And it, it seems self-evident it wasn't uh, for a long time. But being able to quickly either replace or increase your slaves is one of the best things about Jenkins. The ability to burst dynamically, the ability to grow your uh, resources without having to spend a lot of human time recreating your environments is critical. The easier it is to add the slaves, the easier your life is going to be. 
so how do you do that? How do you make your slaves fungible? The, at the core, it's you make the creating the environments easily repeatable. This is true throughout the entire uh, IT, dev, ops, dev, ops, 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 dev, ops, dev, whatever, all of that. You always want to have your environments be repeatable, not just your builds. Now, you can use config management for this, Puppet, Chef, Ansible. Does CF Engine still exist? OK, CF Engine, Salt Stack. There's probably eight more that were invented since I got off the plane. Uh, you can use pre-baked images, like Docker uh, container uh, images or cloud images, AMIs on EC2, uh, Pixie booting. Uh, I use uh, Packer uh, from uh, HashiCorp to combine with Puppet and some shell scripts to generate our build environments, to generate our AMIs that we then save and can just spin up 30 of them when we need them. Uh, I have no opinion on what the right config management tool is, because as far as I can tell, there is no one right config management tool. I have some biases and some personal preferences, but it doesn't matter. What works for you, works for you. Whatever your standard is in your uh, shop, you can just use that to make your build slaves, and you should. Anything that can set up your environment consistently and reproducibly is good enough. So it's not just a matter of making it easy to create your environment and reproduce your environment. You also want to make your slaves as general purpose as you can. You don't want to have this one box that this subset of your builds is the only one they can run on, because then you can't scale. You cannot, uh, even if it's four boxes and you've got 30 builds, that means you can only run four of them at a time. You want to be able to burst out. You want to be able to uh, use your resources better, uh, not have 10 jobs in queue for four slaves while another 10 slaves are idle. So when you can, make your slaves reusable, make them general, make them interchangeable. Uh, I think Docker can, running in a container on a slave is a really fascinating way to do this because you can, if you need access to a, a MySQL server that you've got you know, uh, configured in a certain way it, during the build, during a test build, Fine, run the build in a container that has that MySQL server in it. So you don't have to say, oh, but we only have this one MySQL server configured that way, so we can only run one job at a time. And when you do need specific custom slaves, you should make them on demand uh, via cloud, Docker, whatever. Uh, don't tie up your static resources that are always on that you are pay either paying for all the time in the cloud or that are running on servers that are consuming power and cooling in your data center, don't use those resources for things that are not going to have a consistent demand. Uh, it's wasteful. It's just not efficient. The edge cases should be uh, dynamic and not static. There we go. Uh, and obviously, going to the cloud is a great way to scale. Uh, let Amazon or Microsoft or Google or whoever be the one who has idle resources waiting to be used. You're only paying for what you actually use. Uh, or your IT people or whoever your cloud you're using. Private cloud, public cloud, Docker containers, it doesn't really matter. The goal is to have idle resources uh, is to avoid having idle resources that can't be used for anything else. So that to avoid that situation where you've got a set of jobs in queue for one environment and a bunch of idle slaves that aren't in that, uh, they, they can't run that environment. We end up provisioning about 200 instances for our full builds because we've got so many components and so many platforms. If we had those on all the time, it would just get stupidly expensive. As it is, we can be much more efficient in our expenditures and in our runtime by going wide and dynamic. And we pre-bake all of our images. We do our best to never have a situation where we have to run configuration at instance creation time, at slave creation time, where the slave boots up and it's ready to run. This means we have a, a faster turnaround and we have more consistency because there's less things that can go wrong. And the final habit is join the community. 
Uh, partially that's self-serving because obviously everybody's already in the community benefits from anybody else joining. But more specifically, write plugins, or even better than writing a plugin, extend an existing plugin. Contribute bug fixes, open JIRAs, uh, get help on the mailing list or IRC, and well, what tends to happen once you spend enough time asking questions in IRC, for example, you start answering questions too. It's kind of viral. Uh, getting involved in the community is not just good for your job experience, for your resume, et cetera, though it, it is. Uh, trust me on this one. It's, it's good for your Jenkins usage. You'll be more familiar with what other people are seeing. You'll be a be have a better understanding of the internals. You'll be able to do more with Jenkins and take care of your Jenkins master better than you could otherwise. And plus, then you can speak at conferences like this. It's not actually that glamorous. It's not glamorous. All right. Uh, looks like I got within a few seconds of perfect timing. So uh, I hope you, thank you all for coming. I hope you uh, got some value out of that. Like I said, the slide deck will be on SlideShare. Uh, and I will probably be getting drafted into sitting at the Ask the Experts table uh, at various points over the next two days. And uh, you can also find me on Twitter, A. Bayer, email me, whatever. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff and always happy to help out any way I can. Thank you all very much. <laughs>